So it's my pleasure to be uh, here this morning, and um, uh, I wish to talk to you about this issue of customization of AF ablation. So why do we need it? We need it because although in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation we're not doing too badly, although there's room for improvement, in the treatment of persistent atrial fibrillation, we still have very modest success rates, both in the short and longer term. In fact, in one of the more interesting, relatively recent uh, uh, reviews from the Melbourne group, uh, we see that um, regardless of what technique uh, is used, we have a very modest, uh, both single uh, and multiple procedure uh, outcomes. A single procedure is in grey on this graph, and uh, in black is multi-procedure outcomes. And we know this from everyday practice. Importantly, as we all know, STAR AF2, uh, which was a landmark study, uh, which looked at what you could add to PVI to improve success rates in uh, persistent atrial fibrillation, which randomized patients to PVI alone, PVI plus CFEs, and PVI plus roof and mitral lines, um, did not show any benefit from additional ablation. What's interesting for me for, um, for, for STAR AF is that Addition of linear ablation and CFE ablation did not even improve freedom from atrial fibrillation. I would have thought that it would improve freedom from atrial arrhythmias, but not from atrial fibrillation. But it's interesting that freedom from atrial fibrillation itself is no better um, uh, with additional techniques. So what can we conclude from that? We can conclude that no standardized approach is of proven benefit beyond PVI, but coupled with the modest results from PVI alone, we really have a mandate to further individu evaluate individualized mapping to guide ablation. Now we've been mapping uh, atrial fibrillation in humans for decades now, uh, and in order to do so, we need some technological uh, factors to help us. Uh, we want to be able to map uh, very rapid, constantly changing arrhythmia. So the traditional concept of point-by-point -point sequential mapping with windows of interest and reference annotation is not really feasible. And we must have an adequate ability to recognize atrial activation, to deal with ventricular far field activation, and to have both adequate resolution and an adequate field of view. And this, const this, this balance between good local resolution and an adequately global picture is one that we want to address. Of course, we'd like to have both. There are techniques that have been around which are really only suitable for offline analysis, such as surgical mapping and non-contact mapping. And we're all familiar with uh, Alessi's work from the 90s uh, with intraoperative mapping of atrial fibrillation. Now, this is some uh, uh, non-contact work, uh, again, from uh, nearly 20 years ago now. Uh, but to show you two seconds of atrial fibrillation used to take me as a young research fellow about 10 hours of AF analysis to do. And how believable the data was, I'm not exactly sure. So what about intraprocedural live mapping of atrial fibrillation in persistent and long-standing persistent cases? As a summary, um, uh, we have a number of technologies, Topira, Cardio Insight, the work from BARTS with star mapping, Acutus, which we will hear more from Tom Wong, who follows me, and then I will focus uh, for a bit on Carter Finder and, uh, uh, and work from our group. So as you know, Topira was a very interesting technology using baskets in one or both atria. And this is an example of, uh, very, uh, uh, of global mapping, uh, which introduced some physiologic constraints, including um, action potential restitution curves, into a relatively black box equation to find either focal drivers of atrial fibrillation or rotors of atrial fibrillation. And uh, some very impressive data was acquired both from the left atrium and the right atrium uh, of patients with some very promising early results. However, as you will all be familiar, uh, that was followed by significant controversy, not only because of retraction of work on the OASIS study, but also because other groups, such as this uh, uh, good collaborative effort from the US, 
could not replicate the results first presented. So uh, Topira went on a back burner. Star mapping uh, from colleagues at Bards shows some promise. In essence, what the technique uh, uh, involves is trying to, uh, using baskets again, go back to the source, whether the source is a focal point uh, or the source is a micro re entrant circuit. Um, things are a little more difficult with macro re entry, as I understand it, but important validation work was first performed, including some uh, in vitro work and then some validation work during pacing and atrial tachycardia was performed and published earlier this year. And as discussed, the concept, if you have a stable rhythm, is you go back to the source of what, where the earliest electrograms were. So uh, the group have now gone on to publish the results on uh, using star mapping in persistent atrial fibrillation. And in essence, what they show here is that um, if you uh, look at a group of persistent atrial fibrillation, and if you define an effect from ablation in areas of interest that's either termination or prolongation in cycle length in the appendage by more than 30 milliseconds, then you get 88% um, uh, 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 efficacy in terms of doing something to the arrhythmia as defined above. With, uh, out of uh, these uh, uh, cases, 49 of such areas causing cycle length prolongation, 18 leading to organization into atrial tachycardia, and six terminating to sinus rhythm. Importantly, they achieved 80% uh, freedom from atrial fibrillation at 18 month follow up, which appears very impressive. Cardio Insight, as you know, is a technique using the vest and CT scanning. Uh, and the idea here is to again identify either focal drivers uh, or re-entrant circuits. And the main publication in this field is from the Bordeaux group uh, and published several years ago now. Uh, in essence, uh, the uh, summary of this work is that uh, the analysis shows uh, uh, incessantly changing beat-to-beat uh, -beat, uh, uh, wavefronts, although uh, Areas of re-entry um, uh, are not sustained. They can return to the same area. Uh, they're mostly left atrial, and they had termination in 75% of persistent and 15% of long-standing persistent patients. Whereas if patients presented in sinus rhythm, uh, they found two areas of interest. If patients had more than six months of AF, um, then there were multiple areas and termination rates fell sharply. I owe uh, Acutus a very significant mention, although as discussed, I will not give it all its due credit because Tom Wong is going to speak about it in the next uh, talk. Uh, in essence, uh, it is a non-contact instantaneous mapping system using ultrasound voltage and dipole density mapping. Uh, with rapid uh, reconstruction of the geometry based on ultrasound and then superimposition of uh, voltage and dipole density. Some very impressive looking maps uh, can be obtained. And uh, a key concept in uh, the description of results that can be obtained with the system is uh, that, again, you can have focal activity, you can have clearly re entrant activity, and you can have localized irregular activation, something that I also find uh, is uh, quite a frequent observation uh, with Carter Finder technology, which is uh, what I will move on to now. So Tom will tell you more about experience and outcomes. So Carter Finder is an additional feature built into the Carter system. Uh, we've uh, we used it with a version of Carter called version 5, but it is now in the uh, soon to be released version 7 of our Carter 3. Um, and it, in effect, allows one to create a recording over a period of 30 seconds 
of simultaneous multipolar mapping. Um, and that multipolar mapping is no longer uh, through a lasso, but it can take a basket, whether it's a constellation basket, a bison's basket, or another basket, uh, or a pentaray cathode, uh, but we also have much excitement in the concept of octary, which is not yet CE marked, uh, allowing us to achieve both high resolution and an ad adequately large field of view. It is independent of a timing reference uh, or of a window of interest, and bipolar signals are used to open a mini window, window of interest during which the maximum de negative DVDT of the unit hole is annotated. It has QRS subtraction, and the traditional maps that you will see are maps of so-called 4D activation. They're basically propagation maps through a region of interest, although the system can do uh, phase mapping. Uh, it's not going to be in the versions that uh, we have commercially, cycle length and cycle length stability. This balance between an adequate field of view and adequate local resolution is key. And uh, I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to having Octoray come for commercial use. So these are data uh, shown, shown here uh, with a pentaray catheter placed on the uh, anterior roof of the left atrium, showing an area of interest. And you know, if you look at this video long enough, uh, there are some occasions when you might think there's something focal around here, and there's some and the, uh, many uh, episodes where you make, can make out some rotational activation through this. If in any doubt, the great thing is, you've got the local electrograms and you can just pause and think as an ordinary electrophysiologist, what do I think about what's going on here? I'd just like to show you two cases using Carter Finder. The first is the case of a 79-year-old lady with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation since 2012, who underwent uh, DC cardioversion four years into persistent AF, not surprisingly had an early recurrence, um, and uh, uh, following many years in AF, the local center finally referred her to us. And she was so symptomatic that we took her on for ablation. She had a conventional AF ablation with a PVI and a roof line in January 2018, and sadly recurred was DC cardioverted and again recurred into AF. So the data you're going to see are from the repeat ablation in January of this year. This is a baseline cycle length map, map before PVI. And perhaps more importantly, this is a baseline cycle length stability map uh, before PVI. I find that cycle length stability correlates even better with areas of interest um, uh, as shown by activation maps than cycle length. And here are data from a similar region on the anterior roof. Uh, and I think you uh, may uh, agree that there is something that appears to be rotational. This is clearly atrial fibrillation um, uh, on the roof of the left atrium. If you look at the intracardiac electrograms, they would corroborate something that spans all the cycle length. There were other areas of potential interest, such as this uh, low posterior um, uh, wall. And there's an additional area more towards the lateral part of the posterior wall. Whereas the picture in the left atrial appendage is very different. You can see on the electrograms we start with uh, half a second of disorganization and relative then organization through what appears to be largely a focally driven mechanism have to be very careful to call something focal. You've got to have enough electrodes that are not at the edge of where the catheter is parked. And the automated al algorithm in CARTO actually rejects points that are earliest just at the very edges of where you apply your catheter. But you have to be careful yourself. And uh, we ablated that uh, patient with uh, the lines and focal areas shown here. So in addition to the PVI, we created lines to intersect these areas and we ablated uh, focal areas shown in circles. 
The second case I'd like to share with you is that of a 62-year-old lady with a history of hypertension, only one year of atrial fibrillation, DC cardioversion, restored sinus rhythm for only 24 hours, and she came uh, in for a first-time ablation. This is her baseline cycle length map uh, before uh, pulmonary vein isolation, and you can see in red the areas of shortest cycle length, not surprisingly centering around the pulmonary veins. Uh, similar picture, but not identical picture, when you look at cycle length stability, where you have the pulmonary vein areas and a couple of other interesting areas um, uh, lighting up in red. And uh, following uh, PVI, you can see a shift in uh, what's fastest. Um, again, an area of rapid activity that you will see will later correlate with some focal activity. And the cycle length stability map shows, again, something potentially of interest in the base of the left atrial appendage. And that is a theme for uh, where such areas exist, and again, in the low uh, atrium. So uh, let's look at this base of the left atrial appendage, uh, post-PVI maps. Uh, I think you will see that um, uh, there is potentially something focal arising from this area. I'm sorry, I've left the red dots on, which partially uh, obscure uh, what you're looking at. And let's look at some other areas. This is um, uh, this area of the low posterior wall, which at times looks like it shows focal activation. At times it looks like, well, it will look like um, it's got some uh, re-entrant activation or rotational, I should say, activation. What we do is we mark circles around where we think is focal activity and we draw lines, design lines, to mark where we're going to go and uh, ablate, usually anchoring areas, uh, the center of where the re-entrant circuit may be, uh, uh, and then drawing a line from its center to either an anatomical landmark or an ablation line, such as a wide area circumferential ablation line. And, um, Here's another area of interest uh, on the roof, not far from that area of focal activity that I showed you earlier, which at times looks like it shows focal activation, and at some other times during this recording, uh, you might just perceive um, some uh, potentially re-entrant activity, or rotation, I should say, activity. But there's no doubt that this is atrial fibrillation, and it changes all the time especially in complex substrates. Some preliminary uh, results I can share with you. Um, out of, uh, we've, we've um, uh, in a systematic way, that is a way that um, performs a PVI, and after PVI, we uh, map, uh, uh, almost always with a pentaray catheter, uh, the atrial fibrillation in all the non-excluded areas, and that we then mark the uh, site of any focal activity and site of any rotational activity, and to draw lines from the center of the rotational activity to uh, ablation or anatomical barriers. According to this protocol, we've um, treated 24 patients, um, mean ages or median ages uh, 72, 10 were redo procedures. Um, duration of AF was 60 months, but duration of the current episode of AF was a median of 7 with a range of 4 to 16 months. Reasonably good LV function. Moderate left atrial dilatation, so I've not shown that a bit of data there. The median time to last follow-up is only 155 days. We have patients who are only in the first month of follow-up, but patients who go back as long as 443 days. Nonetheless, without the addition of any new antiarrhythmic drugs, so some patients have stayed on anything that they had been on, but from memory here, only one patient was on amiodarone. 21 patients were in sinus rhythm two in atrial tachycardia, one has come from a redo and it was a, an anterior roof gap, and only one had atrial fibrillation. 
So in conclusion, there's a pressing need to improve outcomes in persistent and long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation beyond improvements in ablation technology that will drive longer lasting PVI. We now need a, uh, we now fully understand that we need a standardized uh, uh, way of individualizing mapping because branding iron approaches beyond PVI have not shown adequate promise. Whether the technology we will be using will be a Q2 star mapping, Carter Finder or something else, all these technologies show much promise but we've been caught out before, and these very promising early results need to be tested in large randomized control studies. Thank you. Thank you, Viaz, for, uh, for sharing that with us. Um, we haven't got a, an enormous amount of time, but I'll take any quick questions. Yeah. I think one of the advantages with uh, many of these techniques is, is that uh, you're not adding huge amounts of more ablation. But if you, uh, you're absolutely right, I would, I would like in my field all studies to be performed by experienced operators with contact force sensing technology, and it would be very useful to um, have some sort of uniform approach of, about what is allowed with ablation techniques. Uh, do you go low energy, higher uh, higher duration, high power, low uh, low duration? Um, there would need to be standardization. Um, lesion validation is actually quite difficult in this. Uh, one could argue for pacing along ablated lines because if you're only anchoring these lines to one side, uh, it's clearly impossible to validate them be beyond that. But when you do lines as is but necessary some of the time that go from one barrier to the next, you would of course have to have the traditional markers of completion. Thank you very much, Fiaz. I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Tom Wong, again from the Royal Brompton Hospital, who's going to talk to us about, uh, is global mapping the key to better AF ablation outcomes? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the organizer uh, of the invitation. Um, a long theme of mapping atrial fibrillation. I think the tradition starts many years ago when I was a fellow at uh, St. Mary's. Uh, I witnessed uh, the first uh, mapping technology uh, aimed to map atrial fibrillation, and also witnessed the pain that Dr. Marty Peters had tried to post-process post a very short duration of atrial fibrillation, which will take him hours and hours. Of course, there are many limitations of using this technology to map atrial fibrillation. You can see the geometry, the shell, is nothing near to what we know of the left atrium. And uh, the ISO potential map is maybe quite primitive in terms of depicting the wavefront uh, of atrial fibrillation. However, it really opened my eyes of the potentials that global mapping can uh, show us in atrial fibrillation. Perhaps it's crucial for us to understand uh, the atrial fibrillation activation as the entire chamber are involved, at least the left, if not by atrial chamber, are involved in the atrial fibrillation activation. Therefore, if one just focus one certain area of the heart, maybe one will miss what's happening in, in, in this very complex and constantly changing activation in atrial fibrillation. Now, some years later now, the technology has moved on. I, I'm just gonna talk about this uh, basket charge density mapping system 
uh, not the other, uh, a, a Topera and uh, the VAS mapping because I did not have any experience in those technology. And this technology is quite interesting to me. First of all, it's overcome some of the limitations uh, from the uh, a non-contact mapping system that some years ago, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, geometry uh, become more accurate, uh, where uh, the geometry is created uh, from the 48 ultrasound electrode, uh, where in the cardiac chamber of interest, where the wall can, the, the anatomy can be uh, reconstructed very accurately. And secondly, uh, the um, non-contact mapping at uh, a, a, a computing uh, algorithm has uh, changed uh, to focus on uh, to uh, record sharper electrograms, unipolar electrograms from the source, the charge source, uh, instead of uh, voltage. So the first uh, a piece of work that uh, we have done is to try uh, to understand the accuracy of this non-contact mapping system compared with contact electrogram. And here uh, you can see that we compare the uh, uh, non-contact signal, which is uh, in blue, with the contact signals in red, the contact signals from the circular conventional catheter. And uh, in overall, I'll show the data a bit later, the, you can see the X correlation is, can be quite high at the high uh, 0 0.978 uh, level, and the morphology correlation is pretty good. When you come to maybe 0 0.79, which is the porous uh, correlation here in this example, over here, in the left atrium, the morphology correlation was not quite so good. So we look at the 20 patients with a bunch of electrograms during sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation, and the morpho morphology correlation really is not bad at all if the service of the chamber of interest in sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation less than 40 millimeter uh, from the center of the basket. Above 40 millimeter, the uh, morphological coloration was not so good. Similarly, as the timing differences, there are timing differences uh, between contact and non-contact, particularly when one is moved away from the center of the basket. Now here, uh, showing maybe there are certain part of left atrium, for example, the roof and the posterior wall, the cost correlation was particularly good, and where the left atrial appendage is, which is further away uh, from the uh, basket, the cost correlation perhaps is not uh, as good. So this global mapping system allowed us to observe certain patterns of uh, activations uh, during atrial fibrillation. And these are some of the examples that we, we may see uh, uh, when we look at the data. Uh, principally, why we look at these kind of ro focal, rotational, and these irregular activation patterns, primarily because of the previous, from the previous studies that's been published. And maybe there will be some other areas that is more important, which we have not discovered just yet in terms of perpetuation of major fibrillation years. You can see there's a focal firing uh, from this particular location. And uh, maybe uh, this uh, uh, isochronal activation can convince you there's a rotational activity pivoting uh, around the just ostium of this particular uh, structure. Irregular activation pattern I find it particularly interesting when we do find area where there was uh, a change in conduction, change in speed whereby entering a little, uh, uh, an area of, uh, uh, and with slow uh, velocity following a breakout, 
breakthrough from uh, one side to the other and a localized pivoting of activity. Now, when we, uh, here's an example of in a patient uh, slides put together by Dr. Verma from Toronto, which I find it particularly helpful to help to illustrate uh, the, this technology and how is, uh, how is the uh, isochromal uh, activation projecting, um, displaying uh, the unipolar uh, uni, uh, electrograms. Here's the unipolar electrograms from all the eight sequential poles around here. You can, actually, you can display electric unipolar electrogram anywhere you want in the left atrium. Uh, here is just an example uh, for uh, an illustration. If I play the video, you probably will see uh, that as convincingly uh, that uh, a, a, as shown by unipolar electrogram, there is a rotational activity in a counterclockwise fashion pivoting uh, just maybe outside the uh, uh, pulmonary veins between the left and the right. And the rotation activity uh, then collide with wave fronts over here. Uh, and uh, uh, shortly after, you may see a, a focal activity breaking out just adjacent to, to the pivotal point over here before it degenerated at least in this area, to more disorganized activity. At the same time, at the anterior wall, there's an area of slow conduction changing away from activation at the middle of the left atrium. Just give you the, a, a glimpse of what atrial fibrillation you may see uh, in atrial fibrillation, where there's different kind of mechanistically interacting with each other at different location. And perhaps to bring home the, maybe the importance for us to have that data uh, in hand, uh, give us a, at least a fighting chance to deal with this tachycardia uh, successfully. So we look at the, these three activation patterns to look at the distribution of this activation pattern uh, with the understanding they change all the time. Uh, we found that they are not randomly distributed in the left atrium. For focal activation, we found the activation, we found the area most commonly found is actually not far from the pulmonary veins, both from the right side and the left, and also at the middle of the anterior wall. The rotation activity pivoting primarily uh, in the middle of anterior wall, or septal aspect of anterior wall, and perhaps at the middle and towards the left uh, lower pulmonary veins. And whereas the more complex irregular activation was found at the middle, at the anterior wall, towards the valve and the middle of posterior wall, and also low posterior wall. So what happened when we target these uh, area of abnormal activity beyond pulmonary veins. After we uh, isolate the pulmonary veins, the distribution of these abnormal areas or the area of interest doesn't really, doesn't really change very much, which is interesting. So the clinical outcome from uh, uh, catablation guided by this uh, activation pattern, the only publication is uh, from uh, a, a multi-center registry spearheaded by Stefan from Hamburg and uh, Andrew from Partworth. Uh, overall, there is 127 patients with persistent atrial fibrillation, uh, 1.9 for uh, years in duration. Um, and uh, the pulmonary veins were electrically isolated first, followed by targeted ablations guided by this non-contact mapping system. And here is the result at 12 months from 24 hours Holter monitor, monitor at a three-monthly interval. The success rate 
on or off antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, uh, freedom from atrial fibrillation is 72.5%, and freedom from atrial fibrillation and atrial tachycardia is 69.2%. This result is respectable. Uh, having said that, this is a single arm study, there's no control cohort, um, so the data is early. So, is global mapping the key to? better AF ablation outcomes. I think we do see some encouraging early data. It may or it may not. But in my, in my view, at least it is a, a right step in the, in the direction. Give us a, a, at least a chance to better understand atrial fibrillation. Um, and, and to help to improve the ablation outcome, which is uh, not uh, optimal at the moment. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tom. Any questions from the audience? Can the machine tell you exactly what you're playing? You mean? So when, when you've got a, you know, a site that is in, yeah. in, in what the mind I seem to do something, mm. to what extent is that a computer-assisted assessment versus just a human? Sure. Um, is there some reproducibility between different operators? So, so uh, first of all, um, so the activations, uh, the uh, a ISO chrono map, that you saw uh, was just a display of the unipolar electrograms, uh, unprocessed data. Um, and um, although there are algorithms uh, to help you to uh, focus your mind in the area that maybe these abnormal patterns locate, uh, personally, I, I I would look at the uh, activation myself uh, to decide where I would like to apply uh, ablation lesions. Um, would, yes, is all operator will come to the same conclusion and look at the same map? I don't think so at this point of time. I think it's quite early for the technology we still are all learning and, uh, and, but over time, if we, can understand the activation pattern during atrial fibrillation better what they mean, yes. And maybe we can come to some kind of agreement uh, as, as well to guard target. A brief question from me, Tom. Um, we've seen some great examples of very nice looking pictures. How does a system cope with more long-standing persistent AF and more advanced substrates where you know, even the contact electrograms look tiny and completely disorganized? That's a very interesting question. I think uh, the answer to that is, uh, first of all, the data we have so far is primarily in um, persistent atrial fibrillation, but not in someone atrial fibrillation for many years. So we don't have uh, the data for the very advanced end of the spectrum of atrial fibrillation. But if we only look at uh, the atrial, persistent atrial fibrillation, even for uh, persistent atrial fibrillation within one year, we have saw some patterns. Yes. For those patients whereby they are in atrial fibrillation for longer, 
we saw that more, there are more sites of uh, uh, activation uh, pattern for interest and we more sites need to be related to achieve termination of atrial fibrillation if that's the outcome that one uh, want to chase. In a very small number of patients that we have uh, to about 40 patients. So uh, precisely that, I think atrial fibrillation, even persistent atrial fibrillation, it is a evolving uh, issues. So uh, we group that into persistent and long-term standing persistent atrial fibrillation, but perhaps the complexity of atrial fibrillation does change uh, in the patient over time. Question for you, Tom. Have you looked at whether these areas of interest uh, correlate with areas of scar within the atrium? Uh, that's the something we want to look at. Uh, we put a grant application together and was rejected. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. That is a good point. Yes, I think someone to look at. Okay. So if there are no more questions, we'll bring this mini section to a close. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for surviving for the third day. Uh, my name is Derek Todd, and I'm from Liverpool, and I have the, the dubious honour of chairing this debate. Um, Andrew promised me in the bar last night that it was going to be a clean fight, uh, and uh, Kim, oh, I, Kim, I can trust. I didn't need to ask him. Uh, so. Uh, so Andrew is for the motion, I understand, uh, that non-contact mapping is the future of 3D mapping again. You all right, Andrew? Where's the, where's the keyboard? The keyboard. I don't know. So one of the key things about non-contact mapping is you have to be very, very adept at using technology. Um, Thank you for those words of encouragement, <laughs> Dr. Uh, so I've been given this rather cheeky title, I would call it, in terms of the, again, I think the, uh, the people who just preceded me have pointed to the issues that I wasn't that familiar with the former clinical systems. I mean, I know that there are a whole bunch of British electrophysiologists who, who did their research in that area. And I think, is it, when I've looked at their papers, I've never been able to find evidence of the difficulty they had in terms of analysis and the hours spent by Dr. Marquitas, et cetera, um, analyzing the data, but there were clearly technical issues. I rather assume that in order to get through the referees, they didn't want to you know, highlight these points too much, but I, you know, I do get this very negative feel in the British community in regard to non-contact mapping as it was in its prior iteration. What I'm going to describe is the way that those problems have been solved it goes back to really a, a, to fundamentally address the basis of the electrocardiogram um, as measured um, from within the cardiac chamber. And all of this is based on electromagnetic field theory. Um, the whole of cardiology, I would say, or much of cardiology as it's developed has been based on electromagnetic field theory. And the fact that this has emerged now as a very viable proposition as being based on a, a, a readdressing the fundamentals of where the cardiac um, signals come from. In terms of cardiac field detection, as referred to, I believe, having spent some little while looking into this, that um, this is the platform for cardiology. If you go back through the 19th century, it starts with a guy called Oersted, 1820, in Copenhagen, and then through Michael Faraday, Patrick, um, not Patrick, James Clark Maxwell, through to um, a guy called Emile dubois raymond who was in Germany, but he inspired this person, Gabriel Lippmann, um, to to develop this very sensitive capillary electrometer. And what one sees here is the basis of its action referred to um, the interface between um, a layer of uh, mercury placed on some sulfuric acid. And they found that if actually this was presented with bioelectric signals, one could get some movements that could be then detected through a microscope. And this was the basis of the measurements then made by Waller in West London 
um, that were the first recordings um, of cardiac electrical activity that then went on through the Strun galvanometer, the work of Eindhoven, etc. And I, the thing I've been thinking is that, um, you know, when our generation of, um, of medical students, we did physics at school and then we went to uh, medical school and then you did all your preclinical stuff and then you looked at the electrocardiogram and suddenly there's this enormous disconnect and even now when I look back at those textbooks you know from this idea of this electrical stuff going on in the heart and somehow you recorded it from the chest wall of the individual and, and that is not not being explained and it's because actually much of it was incorrect in terms of those connections as well as, as it not being you know expressed um, fully in the books that we used to read at least. In terms of, as presented already, you know, the issue that we're presented with, of course, is these um, data whereby um, our capacity to fix atrial fibrillation is somewhat limited in its persistent presentation. And I would, in general terms, there's not much happened over a 20-year period in terms of outcomes, you know, in terms of stuff that's truly published, this 50% is sort of stuck in terms of, um, of where we are. The pulmonary veins that would identified empirically um, remain the source of interest. Um, what I will come to um, conclude on is I do believe that um, atrial fibrillation is basically a problem in developmental biology, and that's supported by the genetic background to it. I think it's supported by the measurements made by non-contact mapping in terms of the areas of interest. It's supported, actually, I think, by the fact that pulmonary veins are often you know, involved in so many patients of the, the ones that we actually see. In terms of because moving beyond anatomy and moving beyond empirical ablation, uh, people were trying to do their best. I mean, there was extensive ablation done, of course, over time. It's still done over time, but as V has referred to, it's not really personalized um, or hasn't been personalized until these more recent technologies become available because simply you cannot track, track these multidimensional signals through, through um, contact mapping. Um, the pers first person really, and I think we have to give credit to Sanji for this, to think about the idea of global mapping um, is, <coughs> points out also the issues. And again, we've just heard about the problems with Tepera. Again, this is one, this, he provided me with this, and this is one of his best maps. And the idea of eyeballing this on a systematic scale across a broad range of patients and coming out with... Um, consistent interpretations, I think, of, was always challenging to me. And, you know, he used to show me this stuff like 2010, you know, I remember in La Jolla in Southern California, and showing stuff like this, and this case, that case of people like Hugh Culkins refers to it as. You know, this is just not something that would provide ever a platform for a rational, systematic approach. Some of it's based on the, the fundamental practicalities of the system, um, the basket cat, and it was basically started out as the Boston Constellation, then moved off into the Tapera basket, but basically um, in, enormous gaps, of course, between the electrodes, and so interpolation was required, or if you're doing point by point, of course, sequential activation. And as again, V has referred to, you know, this idea of a global map, and the idea of potentially remap, you know, if you do something, you're likely to have um, um, effects on things going on elsewhere. Also, the problem with just simply voltage mapping full stop is the problem with far field noise. Even with a bipolar electrode, you're picking up far field. It's not, um, not, just, the vent not just the ventricle, but the local far field signal. And so it's basically, fundamentally, on the physics of the recordings made from voltage-based contact mapping, it's fundamentally flawed by the underpinning physics for the detection of compact sources. So this is where the proposition comes along for a, you know, a, an upgrade, as it were, of the non-contact capacities that we have. Non-contact voltage mapping has a long and storied history, I would um, argue. Bruno Ticardi first presented at the ESC in 1984, but this is his paper from circulation in 1987. And this is in an in a open chest dog. And the um, balloon, uh, being Italian, I this joke about <coughs> olive shaped probe. It doesn't, I don't know what short sort of olive this is, but basically placed him in the cavity of the dog. He was really interested in ventricular arrhythmia, which I guess was the first work done at St. Mary's and such like. But basically, electrodes were placed from the epicardium through the endocardium, and then basically um, um, signals were placed in there. But the point is that he could detect. Um, within the chamber, fundamentally, 
an electrocardiogram, if you like, um, and, and looking at what, what was referred to in the paper's early spatial negativity. The problem is the re resolution was somewhat restricted you know, to one and a half centimeters, which is not what one would ideally <coughs> like. Um, the person that then was inspired by this is Graydon Beatty, who was involved with the um, St. Jude system, uh, as obviously most of you would know. And he, fortunately, then um, was recruited by the Acutus Company. And the big uh, scientific advance that underpins this whole offering then came from a physicist called Gunter Schaaf, based in Zurich, who basically looked at the stuff that was Christoph Schaaf, who worked with Fred Moradi, uh, his son, uh, had brought back from uh, Michigan, and saw, came to the conclusion that it was based on what he refers to as fictitious physics. There's something fundamentally wrong that was what was going on in terms of trying to record electrocardiograms. And this is now just explained in this slide, which is referred to in a paper published earlier in the year. So what we're trying to do is to get to this activation um, wavefront, if you like, and, and, and resolve this at the high, highest level of resolution that one could achieve. And this is a charge layer, this is a capacitive model, if you like. Um, and, and what this um, layer of charge, and again, charge is a fundamental property of matter. One has mass and one has charge, and this is fundamental to physics, again, at every level of resolution. But basically, this is the basis of the voltage field that emerges. The point is that the voltage field is much more diffuse than the compact charge layer from which it emerges. <coughs> as explained here. So one wants to resolve this. Um, the way that the electrocardiogram has been explained in all the textbooks, the big texts, a field called electrocardiology that most of you will not have delved into for good reason, I think, and it's based on a so-called current model. So they've elaborated, it's called the double layer, um, whereby they hypothesize, and it's a hypothetical model, current movements, and somehow they came to the conclusion that these currents generated a voltage field, which even Michael Faraday, 1832, said a current, i.e. a moving charge, generates a magnetic field, not a voltage field. So basically, it's fundamentally flawed in the very basic physics. When we were thinking of how we were going to present this whole thing to the, um, you know, to, your com to our community, the question is, we knew that you would say, well, black boxes having been heard about to pair and such like, so, you know, equations, fancy equations trying to trip us up. And so this, but the point I, I would say is that this is not some artifact and some newly um, hypothesized situation that's come from a bunch of people trying to make some money, but rather this is Poisson, you know, early 19th century French mathematical physics from that era, and he could he worked out he could work out the relationship between potential and charge through these equations back then. So basically, if you can resolve the voltage, you can exclude the distant sources and um, resolve the local sources, and end up with the sharper signals that have been observed in the talk that Tom just gave, whereby the um, electrical or the charge density, if you like, is much sharper and tighter and narrower responding to this layer as opposed to the electrogram, which is bipolar and rather diffuse and not so information rich, if you like. This allows one to acquire electrograms, solve for the charge density, make sense of these non-contact maps. The charge density is then calculated at fixed times, and you can generate activation movies of the sort that you've just seen. So basically, this is the basis of the um, proposition um, that underpins non-contact mapping for the modern era. And this works, in my opinion, which I will now just go on to show you. Um, we have completed, as has been referred to, a trial. It was an observational study. Again, people will always criticize these things and say, well, why wasn't it randomized? Well, one has to enter the space first before you can start randomizing and show that this is safe and provides plausible outputs that make some sort of sense in the modern world. And what essentially we saw that we were getting relatively reasonable um, outcomes in terms of you know, both atrial fibrillation and, and various other atrial arrhythmias at the 12 month time point. Getting really surprising things as well, whereby people, there's a fellow I saw in clinic just a couple of weeks ago, whereby a person with like five years of persistent AF, going back to one of the earlier questions, who we basically did, did in October, and then he had some further persistent AF in just April, March or April of this year. And then after like five days, goes back into sinus rhythm again, and in clinic again, um, just a couple of weeks ago, he was gone back into sinus rhythm. And this is something that I don't think one, one would normally expect to see in a normal approach to, uh, or in the, in the usual persistent case. 
the things that um, um, I think point to the importance of these areas, because again, we're not sure exactly what these areas are at the moment, but they seem to keep coming up. Areas, for example, around the left lower pulmonary vein and similar areas. But the, the idea that by taking out these if you take out more of these patterns, and this is from the uncovered data, this is the odds ratio of success, then, you know, by tenfold increment, if you observe these areas, remove these areas, and the more of these areas you remove, the more likelihood it, there is of success um, later on, and even if there are only some patterns taken out. So it points to the importance, in my view, of non pulmonary vein sources, and that is something that we simply wouldn't be able to resolve, even with the sort of Carto Finder approach, in my view, because of course it's just a remapping capability. You take one thing out and then something else changes elsewhere, even though we've not systematized that at this point, and I think people like Tom are doing that, that is something that will come, I think, in the relatively near future. The thing, I think this is a really a fundamental advance, you know, that basically, um, this is a new technique, and the fellow Sidney Brenner won the Nobel Prize, died earlier this year, a Cambridge-based scientist who, very fundamentally, he was referred here to uh, gene sequencing, but I think, you know, a Cambridge thing like linking genes to function, I think here we have a, a really solid and powerful platform now, 150,000 electrograms every second. I think we, I, there's a very strong argument that atrial fibrillation is fundamentally a genetic disease, and making the number of measurements that one can make that include measurements of contractile function. I think we can interface it with some work that we've done over time of, you know, um, interrogating myocardium with prem stims. It becomes almost like an in vivo protein assay of function, whereby the iron channels, even the, even the fibrous tissue, everything else, one can resolve um, its impact upon the outputs, electrical outputs within, within the system and therefore a new taxonomy, if you like, of disease. I mean, as has been referred to some, atrial fibrillation, I think, is more to the right. Some will be more driven from um, uniquely pulmonary veins, some from other area of the atrium. And if we can break down the different subgroups, we can then make more sense of the genetics, which at the moment is relatively unresolved. And we can also actually, things like single cell biology are opened up and, and then the capacity to see what's actually going on in different areas and drug ability comes in, into the frame. What this, these sorts of patterns have suggested to me, and I, it just came recently, I mentioned developmental biology, but this idea of like the pulmonary veins are sort of locking on. Um, uh, maybe 10 weeks post-conception, within the womb, the heart starts as a tube and then it's folding, and the signals that are genetic are telling different things to happen. And what the, the genes that were identified early on in genome-wide genome association studies, this is the first paper that appeared in 2007 in Nature, um, referred to PITEX, and PITEX is involved in left-right asymmetry in the heart, but also has something to do with the pulmonary myocardium and the linking. And I've been saying to patients this idea of some sort of adhesion, if you like, between the pulmonary veins and the left atrial body is one area of interest, but other genes might refer to other um, potential, you know, um, stirring up, if you like, of the electrical activity elsewhere. And I just put this in this morning and looking at these various things. This is from Patrick Eleanor's more recent stuff, but the these genes are developmental genes, most of them. And even the iron channel genes like SCN10A here, SCN5A, we've, when we've knocked them out in mice, we've found that they have massive developmental <coughs> impacts in terms of, of, of modification of the chamber. So I think now with non-contact mapping, again, we can now make sense of some of this stuff. You know, it's going to be a big challenge and it'll take quite a period of time, but I think we've actually got a way in um, for the first time. So in conclusion, and I've changed the title of this, here, just to annoy Derek, probably, but non-contact mapping is the future. Three D mapping, finally. You know, we've. You know, I think this is now with this interface between non-fictitious physics with technology, we now can get to make some sensible statements in regard to cardiac electrophysiology. Um, I think I can make a straightforward statement that the charge layer is the true source of the cardiac electrical field. It's not difficult for me to state that, based on the evidence that's out there that goes back you know, a couple of hundred years, basically. Um, the calculation of the charge density allows non-contact mapping as opposed to, you know, the, the hard work that was done by the young people as they were in those days, you know, doing their PhDs and their MDs way back. 
and we can actually make sense, do sensible non-contact mapping now that is not frustrating, gives online responses, and it also allows remapping that's rapid. These are plausible, actionable maps of a complex cardiac arrhythmia. I think they can accommodate all prior knowledge. I don't think there's anything that I've read or seen that can't be accommodated within what we're seeing. So we don't have to attack other stuff. We can just say it is, it is brought within this umbrella, if you like. And some like Sanjeev has moved off the terminology rotus to rotational activity to incorporate that. Rotus cannot be measured in humans. You know, they are basically a biophysical phenomenon. And it allows a deep phenotyping. You've got an accessible, quantifiable system here, provides a discovery platform, it can link genes to function. And I think this ve these very granular measurements, I think even within the ventricle, you know, one will we'll be able to make statements in terms of specific risk in terms of individuals, um, um, which I, I don't think will ever be resolved on the basis of the genotype, but on the basis of the phenotype, we can achieve that. So I think, again, I will conclude that, you know, non-contact mapping is the future of 3D mapping. And on that, I'd leave it to um, who's going to come and beat me up next. Kim. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, Kim is going to now debate against the motion. Um, oh, yes. Even though it says Mark in the program. Who does it, who does it say in the program? <laughs> uh, Mark in this program. Oh, Mark. <laughs> I can barely hold him down, yeah. Uh, Could I get some slides? Oh, yes, perfect. Uh, so thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, so non-contact mapping is not the future of 3D mapping. That's, the, uh, that's my sort of argument, isn't it? Because if I'm taking the opposite view to Dr. Grace, um, that's what I've got to say. It's traditional at this point, isn't it, to, when you're debating to show some sort of lurid photos of this person you're debating against or dig up some dirt. And actually, I, I couldn't, Andrew. So, because um, so if you put in Andrew Grace, Cambridge, dodgy photos into Google Images, you get stuff that I really can't show in public. <laughs> none, none that's related to you, by the way, I would just say. Um, also, I, I knew that when I was debating against Dr. Grace, um, if I tried to take the intellectual high ground, I was going to fall very flat on my face, as you've just clearly demonstrated. So um, I'm going I'm to go for this. Um, predicting the future, I'm not sure we're very good at that in this country, um, as this slide demonstrates, really. Uh, do you know what's going to happen on October the 31st? I certainly don't, um, so I'm, I'm really not sure that I can predict the future about mapping. What I can tell you is that if we look at complex arrhythmia ablation, and therefore mapping, I suppose, and extrapolation, we know this, our data in Oxford is representative of all the people I see in this room and all the centers that represent this room. It's an exponential rise for atrial fibrillation, we know that, so BT ablation also rising. So we definitely need tools to map these arrhythmias we do also need to blate them as well. So what do I want when I'm looking at uh, 3D mapping and arrhythmia mapping? Well, I want something that's safe. And I think um, that all the people who put the hard work into non-contact mapping, both in the earlier days uh, in the basement St. Mary's, uh, and also more recently with the really excellent work that's been done with the ACUTA system, have demonstrated safety. So I don't think that's an issue for any of these any of this argument. We want it to be fast, we want it to be effective, and we want it to be accurate. And I think that's, I'll just point that out as the main thing for me. So atrial mapping, can we do that rapidly with contact? Well, I, I think we can. If we've got stable atrial arrhythmias like this patient here has, uh, I hope everyone can see a sort of roof-dependent flutter going there around the left atrium. Uh, we can see the veins have been isolated previously with some low voltage areas, and then a roof line is, is deployed to ablate that. That's done really, I would say, in most people's uh, centers who are doing this sort of work very rapidly, even with a, a contact catheter. I'm not sure that this requires non-contact mapping. Uh, indeed, I'm not even sure what the data is for non-contact mapping of stable tachyarrhythmias. Um, so I think also when you've got quite complex substrate, this is a patient had in the bad old days an extensive cafe ablation um, and what you hopefully can see there is a lot of colour on the front wall, this is the front wall of the left atrium, some little low voltage areas that are grey um, and actually with contact mapping and I think this again is an important point, we'll come back to it, is 
We have good validation of contact mapping for low voltage areas to an extent. Um, so here you can see this rotational activity, but there's a, these gray areas. And you, if we see, play the propagation map, um, we can see we've used a high density mapping catheter. And there's just a suggestion of a little channel just here that everything goes through. In fact, this low voltage area probably extends a little bit more across the anterior wall. So obviously ablated across there because I thought there was a cafe. Clearly didn't have acutus at the time to guide my ablation strategy, sadly. Um, and then one burn, I think there probably does it anyway. So yeah, so that, that's, I think with contact mapping done relatively quickly, accurate, effective, what about the wrong timing window? I think one of the, one of the many strengths of non-contact mapping, I'm not I'm here clearly arguing against, but I'm gonna say, what are the strengths? One of them is, is clearly that ability to, as uh, Dr. Grace described, map, remap, and particularly with complex areas of substrates like AF, that ability to perform a, a intervention, an ablation somewhere, and then remap again. I appreciate that is gonna be difficult if you want to do that contact mapping. But so one of the sort of other things we struggle with, of course, is sometimes we used to have the problem where we'd taken our map and used what we thought was the wrong timing window, and that felt painful for contact mapping. You might say oh, that would be very advantageous with non-contact mapping, but actually nowadays with all the various um, algorithms that are used in all the mapping systems to one extent or another, you can, in this case, sort of turbo map as it is for the precision system. All the other systems have their own feature that allow you to do this very simple, rapid, remapping procedure. So I don't think that's really an advantage of non-contact mapping in stable tachyarrhythmias either these days. So I'm just trying to move on. Yeah, this is, this is me real-time mapping, clearly. Pretty slow, huh? sorry, don't. But yeah, so you can remap again very quickly. What about VT? Because as yet, we don't have the data for VT in, with non-contact mapping with the latest iteration. Uh, a lot of work done uh, with the first iteration of the n array. And I think with VT ablation, what we're all seeing in our practice is that we've sort of moved towards a more substrate-based approach in the patients with structural heart disease. Uh, linear ablation here, short linear ablation, larvas, um, late potentials, trying to encircle scar, that's major undertaking, de-channeling. Um, but all of these approaches, to one extent or another, do rely on accurate delineation of the lower voltage areas. And there's good clinical evidence for this approach to trying to identify the low voltage areas. We, if we just go for the clinical VT, if we just mapped whatever we induced, be it non-contact or just, or be it with a contact catheter, we don't get as good results as if we take a more substrate based approach as that uh, piece of work showed. And also if we go for larva elimination here, complete larva elimination does much better in terms of outcome than if we have incomplete larva elimination. So we need to be able to identify those areas. And I'm not sure yet that I've seen any data that shows that non-contact mapping can reliably, accurately define true scar. Though that's something that I'm very prepared to debate actually afterwards. So again, we're back to what are we doing with contact mapping? Well, we now have an array of high density approaches to mapping, and I'm not gonna show the whole of this video, but there's, this is one form of high density catheter, mapping in ventricle. We now know also that even with contact, and, and so you've got a catheter actually in contact with a tissue that we can be fooled. So these are some, this is an example where on the left-hand side, you see an area that actually is quite healthy here, but it, on the original map, it actually looked like a low voltage area. Now, I have no idea what the non-contact systems will make of that, and that will be an interesting area to explore. But I think at the moment, the future, at least currently, the future still seems to be in terms of contact mapping here, so you don't start to ablate in areas that actually are quite healthy, certainly in the ventricle. But let's come to AF, because that's obviously the, the biggest part of our uh, work at the moment, as ablators at least, in uh, complex arrhythmias. And I totally agree with Dr. Grace that with persistent AF, pulmonary vein isolation is not enough, star F2, quite clearly demonstrated that. It also suggests that cafe ablation was certainly no better. Uh, linear lesions, 
probably know better. I would take issue with that data, actually, because I know there's other data that suggests that at least with linear lesions, there may be some tendency towards a better outcome if they're done well. I'm not sure how well, well, I do know how well they were done in star two because we took part. And, um, so it's, I think there's other issues again, though. I think when we look at the data we have at the moment, and we come back to identifying low voltage areas, there is quite a wealth of data that suggests that this is a, a pretty good approach for treating atrial fibrillation, not just paroxysmal, but also persistent. Um, if we look through the literature, there's this sort of tailored approach uh, as described by the group at Leipzig. Um, and also there's the sort of, there's more data from the Leipzig group showing that actually, if you don't address the patients with these low voltage areas, actually they do far worse than the patients in whom you do address it. How you address it, I'm not entirely sure, but if you do address it, they do better. So when we see the pictures of the non-contact mapping, I'm not sure that I've yet got a feel for where the low voltage is. In fact, that was asked of, I think, of, of Tom and uh, previously, and I think that's an interesting area, one to explore. And when we look at also these other uh, studies that look at other ways of dealing with persistent AF, Again, it, it hinges on being able to define these lower voltage areas. I suppose if I'm sort of being transparent and honest, it, it, I, it's fair to say that presumably the reason we haven't been trying to look for the activation patterns is because we haven't had the tool. And non-contact mapping well, may well provide us with the ability to identify these rotational sites that have been impossible, shall we say, to do really very well with contact mapping catheters. Um, we've seen Tapera, uh, and I'm going to show another one of Sanji's. I, I, I agree we should congratulate Sanji for, for the work he did, but I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, where am I going to blate here? I'm, I can see there's an arrow pointing to a clockwise spiral, and I'm not sure I see it. But, but anyway, I'm sure it is there, because I believe Sanji. Um, and, and then, of course, there's other forms of non-contact, so the vest which some people in this room I know have certainly far more experience. I have no experience with this at all. But again, it is yet to be really established in our clinical practice as to how exactly this should be used in the best way. Whereas it's very, very well established as how we use contact catheters and indeed the development of those have progressed steadily. So this is what I would suggest currently and probably for at least the foreseeable future for me, the approach to persistent air fibrillation would be, which is PB isolation, uh, a voltage map, which would be contact, and then you identify that a lot of people have normal voltages, probably two thirds to three quarters, and in them you probably won't do any further ablation, whereas perhaps with a non-contact mapping system, they might get some more ablation. Um, and then, but in this approach, the third or so, maybe a quarter to a third, who have low voltage areas will do something. What you do for them, I'm afraid I have no idea. So you can take your pick of all of those. I personally would prefer the sort of somehow targeting the low voltage area, isolation, perhaps box on the posterior wall if there's low voltage on the, box, on the posterior wall, but uh, I, I genuinely accept that we don't exactly know. Don't forget to modify lifestyle down the bottom there. And, and there are already multiple technologies out there for this. Um, the Pentaray there, actually, the, the Constellation catheter, the Iran catheter there. You can, you know, there, there are, I've just shown one technology because that's the one I mostly use, but there are plenty out there for contact that show similar results. And then I suppose my final point is, is the future just mapping? Because of course we want to map, but then we, do need to be able to ablate as well, because it's all well and good being able to have a guess at where something might be, but we want to ablate that and actually treat our patients. And perhaps this is a, a way forward for the future. Um, this has just been published in JCE, use of this globe catheter, which can both map contact, uh, map and ablate um, with the same catheter. And that's an interesting piece of technology, uh, which we'll see, see how that develops. So where does non-contact mapping help? Um, I, historically, I should say, this has definitely been the case. Non-sustained atrial tachycardia is absolutely brilliant, I have to say. I used the array for that in years gone by. I'd really like to see whether we can get to use, that, uh, get to use the acutus system for that at some point. 
Uh, ventriculectomy, again, a sort of non-sustained, shall we say, arrhythmia, possibly, if when, I should say, it can be used in the ventricles, I'm sure it's when rather than if. Others, though, yet to be proven, as Dr. Grace said in randomized controlled trials, although I know some of that is underway, there is observational data clearly, but we really do need some randomized controlled trials because ultimately that's what we want. So the future of 3D mapping, non-contact mapping is a future, absolutely. I think it will be in specific cases. Will it be in all cases? I'm not sure. I, I don't think it will be, honestly, but I think it will be in, in specific cases. And I think until definite evidence of benefit, it remains predominantly that the future is going to be contract driven. So uh, I think if you're going to vote, you have to vote against, but don't dismiss non-contact completely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Andrew, would you like an opportunity for a rebuttal? Uh, I, I think in terms of, uh, this is a work in progress. I mean, what, what again, thinking back to the say, the presentations, the uncovers I mentioned, we ha you have to get in and one has to show safety and one has to show some clues as to efficacy to start with. I, thinking about, as Kim presented it there, the, certainly a move now with the super map and other things, whereby obviously this is a catheter that has electrodes on it. It's not difficult to put it up against the wall and to get contact signals at the same time. And therefore that will expand the, the information, if you like, and also um, link in the non-contact measures to the contact measures to give comfort to the community that we're actually referring to stuff that they're very familiar with. In regard to, from my perspective, just overall and thinking about my involvement with this, that goes back something like eight or nine years, you know, obviously much of it under radar, but basically it's looking to the mechanism. And again, it was something that was referred to by Vias, um, the idea of personalized approaches. And again, if you take the argument, this is genetic, this is a heterogeneous disease, there are different areas that need to be identified. We might be able to make statistical statements, as are done at the moment, actually, in the sense of the PVs, it's a statistical probability. You're going to take the PVs out, whether it's paroxysmal or persistent, and there will be a statistical probability in that patient that by doing that, the person will get better. And that's based on the proposition that within the population, the PVs are important. It's nothing to do with that person, because one cannot resolve whether it's PV-driven in that person from the outset. So providing mechanistic data and uh, from the integration between genetics, genomics, um, functional measurements, and then observational data, including randomized trials, will empower all of us, I think. It will may not then be necessary to use non-contact in every case, and I completely concur with that. Again, if you have 100 patients with paroxysmal AF, you don't need to take them all and put a, a non-contact system in. I think it's entirely reasonable. I, I think the prob probably the thing will be with paroxysmal going forward, one will continue simply to um, do the veins. But again, if you gave the person the choice of something that might give a 94% success versus a 65% success for um, comparing empiricism to actual measurement and a personalized identification of locations, I think you come down on the non-contact, even in the context of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. I know that's speculative, but that's, I think, where we're potentially heading. So I do think that non-contact's the future. I think contact's obviously also important. I think the integration between the two, which is coming shortly, will be important. And it, I, I'm, at, I'm told by Vince Burgess, the chief executive of the company, last night that within a couple of weeks we'll be in the ventricles. So I think you know this this thing will move forward, and I don't think it's going to disappear. Kim. And, and I think one of the benefits of being able to rebut, isn't it, is that I can now probably tell you my honest view, which is that I, I you know I agree with Andrew. I think this is a very exciting area. It clearly is a a. I remember coming back to. You know, and the articles A and B, it's, it's very definitely a, a way forward for these patients. Uh, I think there is also, you make the point, Andrew, very well, which is that I'm not sure it's going to be something that we use for every patient. There's, there's been some debate over the last few days about the practicalities of how we're going to deal with what is the epidemic of atrial fibrillation um, and 
some technologies are much faster, whether they're sufficiently um, uh, effective is, is up for debate, clearly, but they are definitely fast. And if we're trying to deal with a lot of people quickly, it may be the practicalities drive it rather than the uh, pure science, which is a shame, but I think it's the real world we live in that if you want to get five to six ablations done in a day, it may be difficult with some technologies, easier with others. But I, I, I mean, the, the mechanistics behind it, the personalized approach, I think there's no doubt that this is a, a really impressive tool, being able to understand it. And I, I do agree. I think if I was given the option of a 94% success versus a 70% success, I'd think about that very carefully, whether my average patient in my clinic will be able to tease that apart, I'm not sure. But um, you know, it is a powerful tool. It, it is a future. I think there's a lot of futures, and it'll be interesting to see how this pans out. Thank you. Um, so uh, can we have a show of hands? Who feels that uh, non-contact mapping is the future of 3D mapping again? That many of you? Surely, surely the motion is for, actually. for the motion. Uh, and against the motion? Oh, well, I'm sorry, Andrew. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I thought with even Kim agreeing with you at the end, you were going to win. Uh, uh, That's but only a surefire way of making sure people lose. <laughs> <don't you? laughs> but, uh, the, so the motion's not carried, but uh, the, the points are very interesting. Thank you. I'm surprised. Yeah. <laughs>